So welcome to today's AS English live lesson. What I'd like to do is to continue looking at sample candidate responses. Um, so we've been doing that over the past few weeks. And uh, let me share my document with you. Um, which one is it, this one? Yes, share. Okay, let's just take it up to the top here. And move this over here and get the chat box down here. And then we are ready to go. So remember, you're welcome to send me any messages as I'm working through the material. If you have questions or you want to make a comment about something interesting, go ahead, feel free to do that, okay? All right, so we have been looking at, last week we looked at some paper two questions. And today I want to focus on a particular question which aims at looking at writing for an audience. So this is very important, this keyword here, this keyword of audience. You want to keep the audience in mind whenever you write these kinds of um, answers or these kind of essays, writing for an audience. And in particular, we're going to look at writing a magazine article. Okay, so let's have a look. This comes from paper October, November 2016, just in case you want to have a look at it for yourself. And this is section B. So remember, section A is the imaginative writing where you can be creative. And a lot of students, or many students, prefer to write imaginatively rather than writing for an audience. But it's good to perfect this writing for an audience section because it does make you more aware of your audience and how you can go about appealing to them in your writing. So the question says, write a magazine article called Traveling for the First Time. The article is aimed at older teenagers who are going to travel away from home and family for the first time. In your writing, offer advice and guidance on how to survive away from your family. Okay, so you've given the format, you know that you're going to have to write a magazine article. So that means you must be familiar with magazine articles. Even ones online are fine. But we know that magazine articles have titles, they generally have subtitles, subheadings, they are not too long in the way that they express themselves, they keep information short and sharp generally, and they try to sound interesting and appealing. So your familiarity with magazine articles will help in this kind of question, in this situation. Always pay attention to the heading, traveling for the first time. What would people need to know, especially teenagers, if they were gonna travel for the first time, what would they need to know? And how would you aim it at older teenagers? Would you phrase things in a certain way and um, be aware that it would be their first time that they're going away from home, so they might be a bit nervous? And your job as a writer would be to offer advice and guidance on how to survive. Okay, so let's see what today's candidate managed to produce here. Okay. So here is the title, Traveling for the First Time. And this is good because that's exactly what you would have in a magazine article. The title will always be there before the article starts. Keep that in mind. And they start out with a positive opening. Hooray, you made it. Okay, you've finally managed. I'm just gonna make this a bit bigger actually. Hooray, you've made it. You finally managed to convince your parents that you are responsible and old enough to travel on your own. And why did the examiner like this? Well, they said there's a lively tone established from the outset, appropriate for a young audience. This idea of hooray, you've made it. Okay, it's like a rite of passage. Um, direct address is used, and that means you. The writer is directly addressing the person reading. You've made it. So that direct address is very important in a magazine article. It makes it a bit more realistic, sounds a bit more welcoming, friendly. And direct address is used indicating a sense of audience and involving them straight away. Okay, so you want to make them feel part of the writing, like the article is appealing to them. So hooray, you've made it. You finally managed to convince your parents that you are responsible and old enough to travel on your own. If you haven't got there yet, don't lose hope. Hopefully this article will help you with some life-saving tips and, um, and save you from getting those, those uh, long lectures by your parents, <laughs> okay? So sorry, I'm struggling a bit with the handwriting, but bear with me. Um, but it's quite nicely phrased, isn't it? Um, this person can put themselves into this position. They can 
think along the lines of the way an older teenager would think and they list the kinds of things that teenagers would dread like a long lecture from parents okay. then they go into the article itself and this is good because they've, they've got an introduction which is separate from all the little paragraphs that are going to have subheadings as you can see the layout the format definitely um coheres to what here's to sorry adheres to a, a magazine type of format and so the marker will know that you are familiar with this and so the first heading that's given is spending savvy and here we, there's a play on the s and they've spelt savvy correctly which is good spending savvy that alliteration and the examiner said subtitles add to the structure of this composition, as well as a sense of purpose, because here you are giving me advice that you need in a very sort of, um, not a formulaic way, but in a very obvious and clear way. Okay, so spending savvy. Traveling on your own also means dealing with money, as you no longer have parents who say you can't have everything your heart desires. Even though you may have heard it a hundred times, you shouldn't spend all your money in one go or on everything you like. Prioritize the necessities now and it will save you a whole lot of worries later. Examiners made a comment here after prioritize. They have said that the use of imperatives continues to directly address the audience. So an imperative is things like, is a kind of a command word, like sit down, stand up, spend wisely, prioritize the necessities. So by doing that, you're still addressing this, the audience directly, and that's what the examiner liked. It also lends a tone of authority to the piece and has the correct function of advising the reader. So the advice is to prioritize. Okay, so it's nicely worded, nicely phrased. Prioritize the necessities now and it will save you a whole lot of worries later. That means make sure you have money for food and transport and always keep some left over in case of an emergency. So that's a very good and valid point full of advice. Now number two, stranger danger. Okay. And here the examiner like the rhyme. The rhyme helps to make the article appealing to the audience, particularly young people. It's playful, stranger danger. Yes, you've been told this since you were little, but this piece of advice could never prove more useful. Keep to the people you know and don't accept things from strangers, either when you're partying the night away with friends or sitting alone by the bus stop. And it's examiner like this because specific hypothetical situations, or situations that could happen to teenagers, um, are, are being described here. So specific hypothetical situations that the teenage reader would encounter. So sitting at a bus stop or parting away. Um, this can prove difficult at a time when you are young and constantly told to be open and social. However, follow your instinctive warning signals. And if a person you don't know asks you to go somewhere with them, don't be afraid to say no. And then in brackets, they've put an aside, they allude to something. Picture Megan Trainer, I think it is, in her music video for Courage. So this should have been, had a bit of uh, quote marks around it, or had some quote marks around it. But the examiner likes this because it's an allusion to pop culture, which should appeal to a teenage reader. This tells the examiner that the candidate is aware of the audience and understands form. And these are the two important things when you are writing for an audience. What form is your writing taken, taking and who is who are you writing for? Who is your audience? Okay, so appealing to teenage readers there. Number three, eat what you want. Let's face it, we're all going to want uh, to binge eat on our favorite kinds of junk food when in a foreign land without parent supervision. And the examiner says there's a continued appeal to audience with the use of idiomatic English, which gives rise to a tone of confidentiality. 
idiomatic English is the kind of English we use every day when we speak to others. It's a typical kind of English that we use. And this sort of conversational phrase is an example of that. Let's face it, let's face it. You'll find that perhaps a lot of foreign speakers wouldn't use a phrase like this because they are not familiar with idiomatic language. And they might struggle with a phrase that says, let's face it, what does that really mean? But here, obviously, the writer is using it in a con confident way. So let's face it, we're all going to want to binge eat in our favorite kinds of junk food, uh, eat on our favorite kinds of junk food when in a foreign land without parent supervision. You may not believe it now, but you'll actually get tired of this after a week and voluntarily want to go back to healthy food like a nice crisp apple. So there's a good contrast there between junk food and this idea of a nice crisp apple. Don't believe me? Fine. But just look after yourself and your body and prove to your parents that you are able to withstand the temptations of that cheesy pizza every day. Trust me, and there should be a comma. In fact, there should have been commas in a few places, so I don't know why the examiner only points it out here, but maybe because it's happened a few times they want to point it out. Trust me, comma, the satisfaction of proving them wrong will definitely be worth it and nobody wants to get fat when on holiday okay so there's some something slightly humorous here um you know the satisfaction of proving your parents wrong and not wanting to put on weight on holiday these are probably things that would concern um teenage and older teenage audience right number four have the right papers well there's good advice very practical advice depending on your mode of transport You'll need to have the right papers and documentation to get by all smooth sailing. Okay, to get by all smooth sailing is a bit strangely phrased. For all to go smooth sailing, perhaps would have worked with better. And the, co the comment the examiner makes here is documentation, approval, and consent are all apt lexical choices. So there's some sort of um, connection between them as a word choice that. Um, applies to this particular section of having the right papers, the documentation, approval, consent, are all at lexical choices of vocabulary for this particular subsection. Okay. These are the kinds of words you would expect to see when talking about papers for travel. So depending on your mode of transport, you'll need to have the right papers and documentation to get by all smooth sailing. The usual necessities include your passport and transport ticket. If you are under the age of 18, make sure you have that special letter with the approval and consent from your parents um, on your travels. And here the comment is, shows a continued awareness of the teenage audience. This is good. If you are under the age of 18, because older teenagers would also be under the age of 18. Let's say 16, 17, 17 18 year olds. Okay, under eight, if they're under the age of 18, they need to also be taken into account. And so the writer is thinking of them as well. And that just proves to the market that you are constantly thinking of the audience. So you wouldn't want to be held up in OR Tambo Airport in South Africa without them, without this piece of paper, or else you'll be stuck waiting and stranded in the and stranded in the immigration office for hours or even days. So a bit of reality there with the guidance and advice. Number five, write it down. All this seems like an impossible load to remember, which is why you should keep a travel notebook, not just to record your fabulous adventures, but also to jot down important things to remember, like departure times, addresses, and phone numbers. Alternatively, use your fifth limb that is permanently attached to your body, your phone. You'll be surprised at the number of useful travel apps your phone can download, not just games and social media. It's also better because you can get, or you can set alarms and reminders so you don't miss your flight dozing off in the hotel room, okay, or the motel room. So this is another nice practical piece of advice. And um, once again, speaking to a teenage audience because Many teenagers do enjoy having naps or sleeping, okay? All right, so let's go down to the next part. Number six, 
surrender to the enemy. Here's an interesting title. What are they going to explore here? If all else fails, the last thing you want to do is have to ring up your parents and admit defeat. Okay, so I'm just going to stop there. Isn't it interesting that here, this person has obviously read through their work because they've added this, this phrase here to give a bit more impact to it. So the last thing you want to do is have to ring your parents up. If all else fails, the last thing you want to do is to have to ring up your parents. So once again, this is continued use of idiomatic speech. If all else fails. The last thing you want to do is to have to ring up your parents and admit defeat. But remember, they are on your side and will always be able to give you advice on anything. Don't be afraid to ask your family and friends for help when you are in a pickle, idiomatic language. Um, how do we know it's idiomatic? Because yes, a foreign speaker might not use that phrase. When you're in a pickle, that's a bit strange, a bit of a strange concept, but we, we know as idiomatic speakers, we know what is meant there when we're in trouble. Okay, so, because the likelihood is that they have been through the same thing and you would rather surrender and ask for help now than letting the problem get bigger and more complicated. Okay, fair enough, that sounds like good advice. And now there is no subtitle here, there's a separate paragraph. So just like the introduction was its own separate paragraph, and then there were subheadings above each of the paragraphs, there is now a paragraph without a subheading. And that should alert the reader to the fact that this is a conclusion. And let's see how they conclude. Hopefully, this article has made you more confident about your independent travels. And here is a proper conclusion to the article because it's drawing the reader back to the present instead of all these um, possible scenarios that are being illustrated for them. Hopefully, this article has made you more confident about your independent travels. And don't forget to have fun and try new things whilst learning about the place and people you are visiting. Who knows? You may even love it so much as to want to live there one day. Okay, there's a bit of strange expression there, but you may love it so much you may want to live there one day. And the overall um, comment to this magazine article is that it is thoughtful and engaging. And this composition shows a strong structure, voice, and purpose. And this idea of voice always confuses people, but you get a sense of the character of the person who is speaking to you. They're slightly humorous. They are practical. Um, they are empathetic because they can relate to the kinds of things that teenagers might think about. So there is a voice of some kind that is created here. Um, so there's a strong structure, voice, and purpose. Uh, it develops each point clearly with subtitles helping to organize ideas. And this person obviously knows to do this because they've read lots of magazine articles. There is a concrete sense of audience, that's for sure. They always address a teenage audience. Expression is fluent. Things flow on generally. There's a few funny things here and there, but otherwise it's fluent. And there are very few errors. This candidate achieves an A in this piece. So they got 20 out of 25. So perhaps if some phrases had been um, corrected in places and certain ideas perhaps elaborated on, although I think they did quite well, then um, they could have gotten a higher A grade. But to achieve an A is already brilliant, Miss Cambridge. So, so well done to this candidate. Now, they're always trying to give advice on how the candidate could have improved the answer. And in this case, they said the use of an anecdote or two, some more varied use of language effects, so perhaps some similes, metaphors, onomatopoeia, etc. Excuse me. <coughs> And a showcasing of the ability to use slightly more ambitious vocabulary, so don't keep it too casual, would have improved the mark. You could argue that maybe with an older teenage audience, you don't want to use too ambitious a vocabulary. But perhaps when you're giving advice and you want to sound credible, you do want to have uh, a bit of vocabulary that gives your, your writing more um, a more solidified and serious kind of feel. Okay, so so that it comes across in a more believable way. Now, it wants them to use an anecdote. An anecdote is usually a short little story of some experience the writer has had um, that could be interesting or amusing, okay? 
So the last time I forgot my papers at OR Tambo Airport, I don't want to tell you the kind of nightmare I experienced when I, without my luggage, stranded in um, a waiting room for hours on end. Okay, so just making something a bit more real, giving it a bit more of a personal touch. Anecdotes are amusing and people like to hear anecdotes. Just remember an anecdote is the kind of thing that your friend would tell you when you run into them and you haven't seen them in a while and they tell you what happened to them a month ago or whatever it might be. That, those are anecdotes. Okay, so overall, that is what the examiner felt could have improved this mark. Then if we go to um, where the examiner elaborates on the common mistakes candidates made in this particular question, this can be quite interesting because it shows you the the way that most students will think about things or approach something and in a way that is a handy tip for you to not do that okay so common mistakes candidates made in this particular question the examiner expected candidates to persuade argue or advise in section b so that is in the whole writing for an audience category as a whole you either had to persuade people of something you had to argue for something or you had to advise them our question was the advise question depending on the command words on the instructions in the question for example question four write a magazine article called traveling for the first time clearly asks for offering advice and guidance we saw that in the question this meant that candidates had to give suggestions in a positive and thoughtful way using language effects to steer readers to accept the ideas as beneficial to them. The purpose and audience were understood to be travel advice for older teenagers traveling for the very first time without their family. So candidates had to select their vocabulary and phraseology to appeal to that age group. Okay, and since we're looking at how examiners expect you to respond to questions, I would just very quickly like to look at question five and question six to see if we can spot exactly what would be wanted of us if we were going to do those questions. So let's go up to question five. This one would be the argument because we can see it's two speakers. Two speakers are going to take part in a debate on school leaving age. One of the speakers argues that students should be allowed to leave school at 16. The other speaker believes all students should have to stay in education until at least 21. Write the text of their speeches between 300 and 450 words each in your writing. Create a sense of their opposing attitudes and viewpoints. Okay, so that, that idea that there are two different speakers arguing two different points must come through. And this is the idea of voice that we've touched on here. Let's look at what most candidates did wrong for that particular question. For question five, the words debate and argues should have alerted candidates to the form expected. In other words, it's a speech. And the command was write two speeches with opposing attitudes and viewpoints. Candidates therefore had to formulate two different speech texts with completely different points of view. The more sophisticated candidates also created two different voices with varied styles of speaking to emphasize two different personas. So perhaps the person that wants to leave school early would be a bit more casual and relaxed in the way they phrase things. But the person that only wants people to leave at 21 is very serious and might be a, a bit more formal sounding in the way that they phrase. So that's how you could create or manipulate the voices to make it a bit more believable. Let's look at question six. So question six said, write the script of a voiceover for a TV documentary called It's Our Planet. And we've looked at this before. The program is aimed at teenagers, okay, there's an audience again, and is about the importance of looking after the environment we live in. And your writing creates a sense of passion and urgency. Okay, so it's a script, it's a voiceover script for a TV documentary. So think of um, TV documentaries where people are speaking over something. Um, for example, um, the David Attenborough, or well, Richard Attenborough, I can't remember his name right now, who speaks over a lot of the wildlife documentaries. That is an example of a voiceover script kind of thing that you would hear. Um, now, let's see what most people did wrong there. For question six, candidates were told to write the script of a voiceover. The examiner expected candidates to tie in the content 
with some visual elements of a TV documentary, not merely write an essay with a passionate argument or a quasi-speech, a semi-speech, exhorting young people to step up to the plate. So you could have in brackets, camera zooms in to um, the rainforest. Okay. Camera pans around the mountains. Okay. Have little things like that if you're trying to make a TV documentary, make it sound a bit more realistic. Let, your, um, let the reader un imagine what is going on. There was no need to write stage directions, but candidates should have written so as to reference the imagined visual components in the documentary. So it's not like you have stage directions completely separate, they can be part of the script. Okay? Candidates should have spent their time in using language persuasively and convincingly. You must do this, it's, it's, a, it's urgent that we take care of the environment. So this is the persuasive factor that would have to come through here. Now, in this final part, focusing back on um, the section B as a whole, the more successful writing for an audience answers kept the target audience in mind throughout and adopted language and structural techniques to match that audience. And we saw that in the magazine article they did as well. Less successful responses were unable to use the conventions of different forms, establish a mature, credible voice, or develop a well thought out, logically organized line of argument. So these are all the things they do want to see. Across section B, as in section A, it was a range of technical and structural errors which often impacted on the clarity and accuracy of expressions. In other words, the grammar, there were grammar issues, sentence structure issues, and that can frustrate the marker who is just trying to um, award your mark on content and ideas because then you have to really work at what's what is being said. The most successful responses avoided this tendency. So make sure you still pay attention to grammar rules and to sentence structure rules. All right, that is everything for today's lesson. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me and I hope to see you next week.